Eco Festival. It's awesome annual event that we're glad to be able to have a wide variety of speakers of internationally acclaimed backgrounds. And here today, we're fortunate to have with us Jared Garcia, who's going to be presenting on human initiated contact. Some really interesting papers, and things that we have to make sure that we look into as far as the data is concerned, that we can make sure that there are more developments that are made in this field. So Jared's been doing a lot of great work with that. He also works with ceramics, he's an educator, he's done a lot of really interesting things outside of this, but this is also something that we're seeing that people integrate into their lives very regularly and need a way to find out how this is accessible, how we can get involved, how we can get more data. So Jared's going to share a lot of really incredible information about that data. Here's some research papers and some of the books that he's looked on and studied for a long time, since 2019. He's been involved with this, so let's give a big hand to Jared, presenting for the first time here at Roswell Institute 2023. All right, thank you everybody. Um, my name is Jared Garcia. As Daniel said, I've been educated here by career, a ceramicist by, uh, in my hobby. And the last few years, I've been exploring human initiated contact, and I'm very excited to be presenting about this today. Um, part of my motivation for the session that we're having today is in my quest, you know, for something um, that is so real, such as human initiated contact, to look for more science or research on what's happening or what can be learned from this. And there's just such, there's so very little out there. And so uh, I'm summarizing today what research I have found and I'll kind of compare those things. And this is a session that I myself would uh, like to be in. And so that's kind of what my motives are and how I'm designing it. So today we're gonna to be looking at two papers from Dr. Acosta Navarro. Um, the first one in Blue Pink here, Extraterrestrials Contact Human Beings an original approach to set the authenticity of alleged close encounters of the fifth kind. So if you didn't think that someone set out to uh, you know, create authenticity around CE5, we're going to be looking at this paper today. Um, a follow-up paper that he produced, the appendix project, we'll also get into. And then um, the other thing that we'll be looking at is a book by Dr. Richard Haynes called CE5, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. It's 242 case files um, looking at human-initiated contact in CE5. And so, let's go ahead and dive in. So if you want access to these papers, I did put some um, QR codes. So if uh, you had your phones out and you wanted to take a picture of these, these two links will lead you to the two papers by Dr. Acosta Navarro. Um, if you want them yourselves, you can see, um, actually I have them right here. Let's see exactly where they're published. They're published in um, GSC Advanced Research and Reviews, and the World Journal, uh, World Journal of Research and Review. So they're both published in academic journals if you're interested in having a copy of that. Okay, so we're gonna start with their first paper. This is Dr. Acosta Navarro. I'm gonna speak briefly about him, just so you can kind of get a little bit of understanding about his motivations and why he's studying CE5. So his background is um, in medicine. He's a doctor holding multiple degrees. Um, he's a medical doctor, at first from Peru, um, and then in Sao Paulo, he got a second PhD, um, and he's currently works with the Heart Institute, and he looks at vegetarian diets and uh, to see how the benefits or the, the consequences of that can be applied. The paper kicks off to say, well, why am I doing CE5, uh, or sorry, looking at the authenticity of CE5? And he just kind of goes through his quick motivation, which starts with, well, there's cases, there's limited, there's limited scientific interest in studying the consciousness-based aspects of, of UFOs. There has been some kind of psychological analysis on like alleged abductions, but it's really through a different lens, not looking at like um, what is the phenomenon that's happening here. And so he wanted to explore authenticity of CE5 and kind of close this gap in research. So if you're familiar with CE5, there's some definitions real quick if you're not. I mean, um, it's coming from uh, Heinen's classification in Blue Book, where he outlined CE1, 2, and 3. Later on, people kind of uh, loosely defined CE4 as the phenomenon of abductions. And then CE5, according to the paper, and this is kind of getting um, more definite now, is described as advanced contact involving conscious communication and reception of information. So this doesn't necessarily mean, if you're familiar with Dr. Gru's protocols, he's not necessarily looking at that specifically, he's actually looking at something a little wider when he's defining CE5, which is a conscious-based contact, right? So that's not necessarily always human-initiated, but it's looking at conscious-based contact, and it will cover human-initiated. Um, and so he made the final contact project. This is like his first project to go validate CE5. And I won't spend too much time here, but it's a multidisciplinary team of people with uh, different types of um, professional backgrounds. They did look historical, so using purposeful sampling of first and secondary sources. 
Um, they organize these, and each case was at least evaluated by two people. So it's not one person evaluating a case to describe if it's authentic or not. There's at least two researchers per case to help avoid bias. Um, and so what they did is they developed 12 criteria, which I'll outline in a second, six subjective criteria, and then six objective criteria. Then we'll go through some rules there about what qualifies to be an authentic case. Um, the criteria are at one point each. The higher scores are going to be increase the likelihood of uh, authenticity. And the rationale of using an approach with criterion, this is quote, is based on long empirical knowledge, is accepting other areas of knowledge in medicine, for example, the criterion of Jones in order to diagnose uh, rheumatic fever. So when we look at the subjective criteria, there's the first six here. So we have uh, the intersubjective, so the researchers are kind of determining these things based on the case. So we have consistency, that there's uh, no contradictions, just the story, coherence, logic, there's a logical sequence, the events that they count, pragmatism, assessing uh, kind of the willingness, the openness of the uh, alleged contactee right to, to even speak. Um, new contributions, was anything learned, like a, a download or something along these things? Sensorial perception, uh, verifying involvement of the senses. So yeah, were there other things going on, uh, telepathy or things like this? Then intuition experience, this is just kind of looking at the intuition of the researcher themselves to say this makes sense or this doesn't. So these are subjective criteria, right? And then we also have six objective criteria, which were, were there other witnesses at the event? Was there evidence of paranormality? Presence of physical evidence that could be um, classic, like footprints or something burned, or well, as well as on the body. Uh, body evidence, you see next. Program contacts, that's, um, was, was the contact premeditated? Was it made in advance to journalists or to news reporters or something? Um, where it's declared in advance that we're gonna have contact on this date or this time, and then was there scientific proof that came from it? So these are kind of all the six objective criteria that they used to measure it with. And so real quick, we'll get into some tables here and we're gonna explore this data. To be considered a high probability for authenticity of a CD5 case, according to Dr. Navarro, um, they need to have all six subjective and at least one of those objective things. So the first six subjective criteria we, we went over, the, the story or the case has to be all of that plus one objective one. If it didn't meet all six, it's just considered inconclusive. It's like we can't make a decision on it because it didn't even pass kind of the first smell test of getting through our subjective criteria. Low probability are cases with um, fewer or five, I'm oh, sorry, inconclusive was they met all six that had no objective. So it looks like the story is good, but there's nothing objective to kind of reinforce that story. Low probability is where they didn't even get the first six. So really what we're interested in is focusing on these high probability cases. Um, I'm actually going to skip this because I have it illustrated better right here. So we started off in the first study, they went at 102 cases, 30 of them um, just didn't have enough data so they couldn't run the model, the 12 criteria rule. So they ended up with 72 cases that they analyzed. Um, they applied the 12 criteria rule by these two researchers that I described, and then we ended up with um, 47 being low authenticity, none were inconclusive, and then 25 cases of being a high probability of being authentic. When we look at the table of scores, and I'll just pause here for a minute, SC right here is subjective criteria, so you can see the first six. These colors, um, and then we're looking at high probability, so they have to meet all six. So if you look at the left-hand column up to six, you'll see all six bars of color go across because they have to meet those six. And then the objective ones, which are your top six markers, you kind of see scattered in here. So other witnesses look like it was um, dominant, some scientific proof, and some other uh, ways that you can see push it from just being the original six subjective to over one. On the low probability, the slide's probably less interesting, but we can at least see of those first six that were missing. So a lot of people had consistency in their um, case or coherence logic. It starts to break down around pragmatism and you don't see them even getting to all six. So, um, among the offensive contactees, there was a, uh, a predominance of men in this case study that they studied, uh, and they went a little bit into what, why that could be and just how they were kind of sampling. The average age of what they did was 33.7 years. Um, it was all across several continents, um, especially in South America, where the studies being done was the most predominant of the cases. And then let's look at some information. So out of the questionnaires provided to, um, or the 72 cases of high authenticity, there was some kind of common patterns in the data that they were talking about their experience that they had. So I wanted to look at some of these because I thought these were important. So one was on the left-hand side, you have the origin of ETI. Did anyone come across the origin? You have some multiple answers here. Um, the motivations for visiting Earth. Number one was awakening consciousness. Number two, 
study or explore of three nuclear hazards, you kind of get some themes here that are running this continuum. Also information that came out of the first study was there's a, a, a lot of the, the 19 people, out of 19, I think it's 16 say that vegetarian was recommended from their contacts. Um, some were forbidden fish. And then these are also really interesting. So 18 out of 18 um, had, were critics of capitalism or money-based systems after their experiences. Um, 12 out of 12 also believe that reincarnation is a real phenomenon. And lastly, the presence of ETI among us was also uh, 15 for 15. So when you look at cases, this is just kind of the, the, the data that spiked the most, right? Where you're seeing all, you know, 15 people out of 15 people all said that post these experiences, we believe, um, you know, uh, presence of ETI among us. So in the discussion of the paper, um, they're, ex they're excited that they, um, through an original approach, were able to declare with a high probability of authenticity of alleged CD5 cases. They feel like there's valuable information for these cases, and they like that there's two observers who kind of um, work down on the bias. They go over some limitations, which says, um, I was going over one of these. This way lacks the gold standards for validating the authenticity of CD5 cases because of the, what he says, is non reproducible nature. Meaning, they can't go back in time to the actual cases and be there for that moment, right? So there is a limitation that they're looking historically back into time. And the conclusion of the first paper here is using the original approach, we found evidence to support that advanced contact with ETI with human beings is probably happening on Earth at present. Future studies will confirm these findings in other places around the world. Additionally, these authentic C5 cases are important revolutionary information with maybe potential for our society in several fields of knowledge. So that's the first paper, okay? So you have a good feel for it. I, I think it could be, we can go farther, but I wanted to kind of first start on that paper. And then we have a follow-up paper from them, and this is gonna be a lot shorter here. So um, in the follow-up paper, they're basically gonna continue years later down the road, and they're gonna take the same 12 criteria that we do it with different researchers to see if the same types of um, conclusions come out of the data. So now they're calling this one the Epiphanous Project, where the first one was called the Final Contact Project, FCP. We'll call this one EP. Um, it was organized by the Latin American Association of Ufological Studies. I may have had that um, acronym a little bit off there. Uh, he assembled a team of 14 uh, multidisciplinary professionals, and they're going to go do this research again. It was carried out from 2016 to 2021. The paper was actually published in the journal in January slash February of 2023. So this research is like only a few months old as far as publication goes. Very similar. So we're going to copy the, the first con the final contact project to researchers. Um, 12 criteria rule, and then the same definitions of authenticity. They did say if someone got 10 to 12, that they would call them a super contact. Um, in addition, they went through a 98 question questionnaire to help pull out some of the more nuanced data of the contact experiences, which we'll get into as well. So on this one, we start off with 92 cases. We lose 26 to insufficient data. Uh, 66 of the alleged C5 cases are analyzed by the uh, 12 researchers. And in this case, 52 are low probability and 13 end up being high probability. Again, we have this chart here just of the high probability. You'll see up to six, kind of that teal. It's gonna be the same all the way across. And if you look up, it looks like other witnesses, again, is one of the first objective criteria that are the most common across these. When you compare these two projects, the low probability is definitely the higher bar, right? Um, and one of the limitations he mentions is this isn't to prove one way or another is to create a high a probability of authenticity, right? So we're not saying it's 100% black, white, yes, no. What we're saying is there's a high probability of this being authentic or something like that. But again, in both studies, you do have um, a portion of the data coming in under this high probability, which is exciting. Um, more, so this is gonna go more into the data of, of, of what we have here. So there's physical descriptions of spacecraft, very common, so all anything in orange is yes, that dark gray is gonna be no. Um, descriptions of ETI, so there's you know, encounters with uh, beings, if you will. Um, uh, descriptive data that came out of this included telepathic manifestation, excuse me. The number of encounters was more often, more than once. So you can see the orange here. Three times or more was the, the highest one across both studies. So it seems like that people that are initiating or having these C5 experiences, it's an ongoing thing. It's not just a one-time event. Again, these origins, I just want to point out that awakening consciousness was the, the top motivation across both the EP and the FCP here. So some interesting kind of um, experience or data that comes out of this. A little more, you can see the comparison of vegetarianism on the top left, critics of capitalism or um, you know, money-based systems, 
presence of petite fungus and reincarnation. So again, that data is kind of not just in the first study, but when they repeat the study with whole set of cases, again, they're kind of finding these themes. And then lastly, this is kind of a snapshot then of like, what are all these characteristics kind of lumped up into one thing? So the most common characteristics across all of these cases included you no know, um, telepathic manifestation, fewer more encounters like we talked about. Maybe the, maybe the motive is to awaken consciousness or something, or to alert that kind. The um, vegetarian recommended, so these are kind of like a, a, a sample case of all the highest um, data points that we came across. And I'm gonna skip a little bit here. Okay, so in conclusion then, when we compare the final contact project, the first one, to the uh, Pismus project, um, both are an original approach to determine authenticity. They tested that and they found that um, there was a high probability of it across both cases. And the second one, which was cool, is that there was you know, a second effort event that says new research teams could carry out more research using the methods, the criteria in the future. So something that could be repeated into the future. Um, we kind of went over this already. Again, yeah, we found evidence to support advanced contact is happening, and there's more to be learned from this. So this is a summary of those two papers. I wanted you guys just to get a feel um, for those papers. And now, again, I'm just trying to summarize where is current research at within CE5 or human nation contact. And my conclusion is where do we go from the research that we have. Before we get into this next section here by Dr. Richard Haynes, can I get one volunteer to pass out um, a handout? Thanks, John. I'll keep one for myself. As we go through some of these cases by Dr. Haynes, um, He's created some tables uh, of how to evaluate his case studies, and so I just created a little key so that when we look at some of the case, cases themselves in more detail, you can have a little information. So Dr. Richard Haynes' books, um, where did I put the book? Um, here's the book again. And so um, it is split into three sections, but I just wanted to split into four just for the presentation's sake. And so part one, we're going to go into the, the methodologies used for this, this type of research now in CE5. And then really the cases fall into two groups here. One is on the UFO response to certain human behavior, friendly human behavior, hostile human behavior, human thought, miscellaneous behavior as a UFO response. And in the second chunk of the book, it goes into humanoid responses to most of those same things. So how do those, are there cases of humanoid responding to friendly behavior, to hostile human behavior, and what does that all kind of feel? and then analysis and discussion with them too. So real quick on the methodology use. I know this is data heavy, but it's kind of lining up here. Um, all right, so Haynes opens up saying in most cases, um, there's not always, you don't always see interaction happen in UFO um, cases. Um, and so he wants to consequently this book is focused on cases where there's interactivity between a UFO and humans. Um, he notes that Stephen Greer's, because again, we need to get into some common definitions of what is CE5 or human initiative contact. His book is called CE5, right? Close Encounters of Fifth Kind. So he notes that he, he believes Greer's definition is, is too narrow to capture such a wide range of experiences of interactivity, right? Um, so he defines CE5 as Close Encounters of Fifth Kind refers to any reported experience of deliberate human behavior that was soon followed by an obvious response from UFO and or humanoid. Uh, which included uh, other effects suggesting it was not coincidental. And so where, um, you know, Dr. Costa Navarro is looking at a consciousness-based phenomenon, Dr. Haynes is looking at if I'm in a car and I see a UFO on the road and I flash my headlights at it and it flashes back at me, there's some sort of, I initiated communication by flashing my headlights and it responded back to me. So he's, he's actually looking at a wider or a different lens of what is um, CE5. He's really looking at anything that's inter interactive. Yeah. So not necessarily conscious based, but real quick, when you look at the, um, well, we'll get into it, yeah. So what are different kinds of deliberate human behavior that we could use to signal to UFO? We could use lights, and he has some, some listed there, um, ionized radiation, radio frequency, right? We could project a and from signals, we could might use microwave energy or radar, um, we could use acoustic vibration, noises, sounds, tones, yeah. things like this. Visible projectiles, right? Some of these responses are hostile from humans where they're from, you know, shooting a bow and arrow or guns at it, right? So these are other things we can use to initiate communication, if you will. And lastly, he does explore a little bit here of thought-based telepathy, um, which is where I'm most excited about researching is, um, you know, can the mind initiate contact? And so here's how he's gonna break down these cases. So we're gonna look at some cases, and this is kind of on your handout here. 
So how does he kind of um, slice up these interactions? So one way is the duration. So on the bottom, you can see just the duration of the human starting at less than one second. Less than one second would be things like flash, instant, pulse, briefly, right? Those are some of the key, what words that would come out of the case of um, how, how quick the human uh, action was. On the left-hand side here is the response of the UFO or of the humanoid. Um, and we'll get into the summary of, at the end of the book, all this data is summarized, which is really exciting to show you. But we have duration of behavior, we have complexity of behavior. So real quick, low myth on the bottom again, humans just low, medium, high. Low is, I see a UFO, but I just kind of keep driving home. Medium is, I see it, I stop a few times, I flash my headlights. Complex is, you know, I get out of the car, I bring out a flashlight, and waving my arms, and yelling at it, right? It's, more and more complex behavior to initiate that contact. And the UFO, these are just some examples here. A low response could be it just emits a light or even just its presence is known. Um, next is it emits complex lights back or directs its um, attention towards the human if it's, if it's a being. Um, and the last thing high would be like just everything you can imagine, light beams, it's circling around the car maybe, attempting to communicate, mimicking um, the gestures of the human, things like this. And then we have also um, a score of was, was the behavior premeditated? So how much, table one basically says on PB1, premeditated one, is when the phenomenon is visible already. So like I said in this instance, I'm driving a car and I see a foe, so now there's something visible that I can react to, right? So that's kind of what those cases are. PB2 is where I'm really interested in, which is a non-visible phenomenon. So we're initiating some sort of um, human action without even seeing a UFO yet, right? So any case that had PB2, I was extra excited to kind of uh, dig into that case. And then lastly, it's just the response, like how, how, far, how long did it take for the UFO to respond? Um, and he kind of, he would um, appreciate more cases that had a tighter response time than cases that took, you know, um, hours later to respond. Um, is that really a response to that human initiated thing? So let's look at, um, the book's gonna go into a lot, I'm just gonna highlight a few cases here, but um, how do UFOs respond to these various human behaviors? So this is case, I just have a few cases here that I wanted to show with you, and as you look at the left column, especially in the green, where it says DBJJ, or complexity A, uh, PD1A, PD2X, now you have your chart in front of you, if you wanna kind of decode what that is, then you can look at your handout and that should kind of help you make a little bit more sense of the case. So in this case here, we have a lady, this is from 1973 at 4 a.m., uh, it's about 30 minutes of the case. She sees you UFO while driving, it follows her above the trees. This was a long story that I really cut down. Um, she sees an entity and, um, and then she kind of loses it and she ends up crashing into this like neighbor's yard, into the driveway, the neighbor comes out like, what's going on? There's a UFO there, they call a, a police officer, and then he comes and shines his light at it and it shines a light back. So um, again, that light kind of, that, that's why this case is in the book, because there was a light going back and forth. But note from the person himself, she said, um, then the eyes seemed to come right at me as I would, if I were maybe six feet away from it, right through my windshield, and I heard in my mind, um, through my ears, someone said, please don't be afraid. My whole body felt numb at that. So I really like that anecdote on that. It highlights some anecdotes in these cases. We'll talk about some of these anecdotes later. Case 56, it's 1977, um, at night in Scotland. Uh, Derek Lauder, 25 years old, was outside in a cabin near Boston Castle with a flashlight. He had some prior experiences and received a suggestion to go out with a flashlight to see if he could get some type of response. Uh, so, quote, uh, I went outside with my torch to begin a signal with a couple of quick flashes of torch light at various parts of the sky. I did not know what to expect. I signaled in the area of Legio Major and Cancer. Immediately afterward, I saw two flashes of bright white light from something which was covering the star acumen to the constellation of Cancer. I signaled again, and again I received uh, replies of white flashes of light, which is my first attempt at using a torch light. Um, I like this one a lot. There's not, um, again, this is a PD. Oh no, not a PD2 case. And here's a picture that he illustrated. You can tell from the picture he's aware of astronomy, right, to a certain degree. Um, I thought this was interesting too. Let's continue. Case 59, 1977, early autumn. Denise is a policewoman. She was trained at the Royal Observer Corps for aircraft recognition. She's a bus stop and she sees UFO 300 feet away, rising. Um, and this little anecdote here, it was no, she says, but I thought, come down here and let me get a good look at you. She was not all frightened and sensed no hostility or danger. Immediately did this change course to begin to move in her direction, but then very slowly moved to elevation 90 degrees for the next time. And so in this case, it was interesting because it's really just a thought of, can you come closer, right? And this the UFO seemingly responds 
to this thought. And with her background as a, as a trained uh, observer of the aircraft. And that's her sketch of the police. Or this actually this was an artist sketch. Kids were a little bit more contemporary, 1992. Um, this, you can see PB2, we have a B, so if you look at your table, this means yes, meaning that this is a premeditated response to non-visible phenomena, just in the case. So C SETI investigators traveled to Belgium to provoke uh, a close encounter or a UFO landing. This was mind-blowing to me reading the book, is how often in the 90s, um, Dr. Greer was, the goal was to make a craft land, so not just initiate contact, but to make something land. They reached a high ridge near Angry uh, Chapel Village and implemented their contact protocol through projected thoughts, spotlight, and special noises. They attracted a large triangle craft. This case is quite long, I've summarized it uh, briefly. It did blow the clouds, revealing a bright blue apex. Um, shortly after, low vibration sound came. Oops, and that was it. So I wanted to highlight here the provocation of trying to get a UFO to land, which is um, mind blowing. Case 75, we're now in March of 1992. This is Santa Rosa Island near the Gulf of Florida. Complex event, again, with sea city workers or Gulf Breeze. Um, there's 39 people gathered. Um, a sense of unique excitement they talked about together that they had. They call it coherent thought sequencing, uh, CTS. This was used specifically here to make contact with the visitors. So again, we're in this PD2B case, right? So initiated contact without seeing anything. Um, and Dr. Greer senses the connection. They, uh, they, they use candles. Um, basically to say, come here in the beach, right? So using torches to, to draw to where it goes, and the UFO responds to that. This continues, 8.24 p.m. after projecting light beam triangles for about 20, 30 minutes, a squadron of five UFOs appeared, evolving from a bright circle. Um, Dr. Greer, a signal of powerful light, and UFOs responding in a clear and clear manner. In the photon dialogue, meaning like, if I flash a certain sequence of flashes, am I getting those flashes back in that same mimicry? Um, it eventually disappeared, but he drew those from five things disappeared. Greer draws a large equal out of a triangle to, to prompt three and then three UFOs come. Um, just crazy, right? Um, all, all seeming, again, without seeing UFO first, using this coherent thought sequencing, lights, sounds, right? Um, just attempting to get at, can we initiate or spark response from the phenomenon? Let's continue. Oh, the formation feels in the move towards the group. Um, we can talk about this case, we're good. Let's move on. Let's get time, too. We're good. Case 77, um, one more from PD2 here. So again, a CSETI team traveled to England this time. We're out uh, in Wilshire, England, to study crop circles and track UFO to the location. They use, again, coherent thought sequencing, a high intensity spotlight on three sounds. Despite a heavy rain, a large, ribbly lit disc shaped craft with rotating lights approached the team's location in a wheat field. It was silent, 80 to 100 feet in diameter, and came within um, 10 to 30 feet off the ground. Team signal craft with three light flares and respond in the same sequence. This uh, signaling sequence was repeated with a similar response to the station. So again, that mimicry here. Um, then a small amber object attached to the craft and ascended into the clouds. The craft caused magnetic disturbances affecting compass readings. After 10 to 15 minutes signaling, the craft proceeded in the midst and disappeared from view. No, everyone present also felt an electrical charge, a tingling sensation during the close encounter. I thought that was a really important anecdote too. Is is there any biofeedback um, that happens during contact, right? And um, so we're looking at anecdotes for what science can be done about this. We'll continue to case 83. Um, this is in Santa, uh, Susanna Pass in Chatsworth, California. You, you may be familiar with this case if you know Dr. Joseph Burks. So he recounts the story of 12 of them going to go do CE5. They actually start, the, the group splits from 12 into six, six go back. He's coming back down the hill with um, his group of six, if you will. And there's a little valley, about 145, while leaving the site, the group witnessed two powerful lights high on the ridge. The lights were about one, two feet in diameter, about 400 feet higher than evolution, elevation. And quote, Dr. Burks wrote, we see SETI use predetermined sequences of flashes. If the objects are signaled back in the exact same fashion, then we know some kind of primitive communication has been established. And now we're getting to the meat of this, is, you know, is there primitive communication happening through some sort of human nation contact or C5? Communication. Uh, again, continue quote. The left light signal back by, uh, by exact, be mimicking my complex pattern. Each time I completed a phase of photon talk, the exact strobe reply flashed back from the hillside. The reply was almost instantaneous and followed each of the flashes from the handheld spotlight. So again, more and more evidence in this book, right? Now, I'm only having a few cases here, but 242 cases. I'm, I'm purposely kind of profiling ones that have a little bit more to do with thought-based initiation. 
but the book has um, a wide variety of cases all about response to the foes to human behavior. One or two more here. Uh, 1996, Crestone, Colorado. Uh, event during the Sea City uh, training weekend, San Luis Valley, Colorado. Again, there's coherent thought sequencing. Around 1.40 a.m., Dr. Muir dismissed both the team, but 10 people stayed behind. To a 5 a.m., uh, orange red pulsating objects moved towards Mount Plaka for a signal of the light, and the craft pulsated back three times. We found thoughts of welcome, peace, and friendship to the craft. The immediately leave the craft increased in its illumination and pulsed brilliantly. And again, an interesting anecdote is um, does anything with the type of thoughts we're sending, we're sending have to do with the responses we get? So I just want to highlight here that the type of thoughts being put out here are ones of welcome, peace, friendship. Uh, things like that to the craft. So um, we summarized the chapter, which was a large chapter, really like over 90 cases on responses to friendly behavior. Here's, uh, this is interesting. So on bright lights, so these are all the ways um, UFO response to bright lights. So if someone shines a bright light at a UFO, here's kind of the responses broken down to a table. It left, it became brighter, it approached the witness, it repeated the flashing sequence, disappeared, um, it didn't move. Up here we have UFO responses to waving, shouting, other gestures like this. Uh, the highest one, it approached the witness, it departed or did something else. This bottom table here, UFO responses to airplane movement, meaning I tip my wings to signal to UFO as I'm flying, something like this, um, and accelerated away or it disappeared. So again, we get some interesting kind of um, data out of this. Um, I hope you enjoy the tables. The, yeah. And then um, this now, the next section was on hostile behavior. I don't want to spend too much time on all the cases, but I wanted to read through the book. So here's our summary of this section here. UFO responses to beams being fired upon from the air or the ground, right? So any cases where someone fired a weapon or a car or something like this. So uh, speed and motion features. So the UFO responded by um, never moved. It reacted in a specific manner. It may have changed color, so it could have brightened, could have emitted a visible beam, uh, uh, auditory, it could have hear noise. Um, things like this. So this is the response to UFO, and, and what you do see, or what you don't see here, is a lot of aggression back, right? Um, and that's what I really want to bring this table up, is you don't see a lot of aggression back mimicking the human aggression behavior. Let's continue. UFO responses to military aircraft approaching or firing. Um, they outmaneuver the plane. They did destroy the plane, so there's a little bit right there. Um, the UFO reacted other ways, accelerated away, or became invisible, okay? That was the hostile human behavior. So we're going to continue. There was a short section on human thought, um, and it was only six cases, so that, that was actually hoping that section of the book would be larger, but it's short, and in this, or seven cases, sorry, um, just a few cases here. So in the seven cases where the witness transmitted such thoughts, the UFO reacted by approaching the witness in all seven cases. So in this section where he's talking about just thinking, the UFO always got closer. Um, of the two cases in which the witness was afraid, Needed to be left alone, the UFO reacted by flashing a light and departing. So those are the two um, responses to be afraid. And then of the nine cases which the witness asked for for a particular response, it performed the requested response in all nine cases. So pretty interesting data coming out of the thought one um, and how similar they all are. There was one more miscellaneous case I wanted to go over. This is case 200 out of 242 or 1985 uh, in Norway, right? Um, this is very popular, the, the Hestlin or Vinnie Adams yesterday was using it. But um, I just wanted to get into this, this one part here, which is at the end of their field research, they concluded that the phenomenon is capable of being registered on measuring instruments. And this is really going to lead us into our final section, which is where do we go? Uh, if this is the current research that's you know public on CE5 information contact, what is it telling us and where can we go from here? I'm going to skip that miscellaneous. And the humanoid responses, so that was all UFO responses. So I'll go real quick through this. Um, so a human entity or being or humanoid responses to friendly behavior, some common characteristics included um, visitor reaction to the friendly response, waving back, um, quick movement inside the craft, like we're kind of getting out of there, an approach avoided response, um, absence of harm towards humans uh, was continuously stated, and then, um, yes, then hostile. Human responses to hostile. So we looked at UFOs, how they respond, like being fired upon. This is how humanoid or cases with beings or entities then responded to hostile human behavior. And he was really firm on this. He says, I suggest that humans are the direct or indirect cause of the alleged aggressive alien responses in almost every encounter. If this can be proven to be true, that the implications are enormous. It's impossible to control the aggressive tendencies of human beings and analyze potential danger. 
um, for the future, whenever alien life forms may use the Earth. So he was he was um, really, really focused on that the majority of responses to hostile behavior were not aggressive back. So data, real quick, entities being fired at. Uh, the 10 incidents analyzed, the immediate reaction observed, it's oh, they, immediate, there's immediate reaction, entity fires came back. This is often some sign of like flashlight weapon, uh, in the cases, like the, a beam or something of light that the, the entities might have that kind of freeze you up or block you or something like this, um, or no responses. Data continued. If they were fought with, uh, they were knocked backwards, a hair got pulled out once, one was a physical examination, a gun broke, um, I'm trying to do that, and then entity responses to other forms of threat, um, alien interactions after humans, yeah, it's 20% of the case. This is just kind of breaking things out, sorry. Okay. This is where it gets really good. So in chapter 10 of the book, he's gonna summarize now, really with this table of data that you have in front of you, all 240 cases. And so there's definitely some tables that I'm not gonna go over, which include like the frequency of time of day of the cases, that's gonna be most frequently at night, or hours of darkness, the distribution by year. He did find uh, some clumping of cases in 57, 67, and 77, and 93. Um, the duration, uh, the, 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 the mean uh, duration of friendly behavior is about six minutes. Um, as well as UFO, show, uh, UFO shapes reported. But here's what I really wanted to get into. So um, we talked about the duration of behavior. So we're familiar with this chart from before, like how long is a human initiator doing some type of action? Then what's the response? Um, and you can see, this is kind of a breakup of it, but if you look at the data points across, there, it does look like there's, there's a correlation here, right? So I highlighted the ones in green, but that's directly then um, from half a minute to five minute of a human response, that exactly the half minute to five minute of a UFO response. And you, you need to see that go up one more when you push to five to 30 minutes. Again, it almost goes to a long counter. So there was a little bit of some correlation here, which was interesting, um, these prominent increases in those half to the five minute and the five to 30 minutes. Similarly, when we look at complexity of behavior, um, so on top, human behavior is either low blue, medium red, or high green. The, the UFO response here, so from low, it responded mostly low back, right? You look at the medium response from human, and again, 44 over 31. So when the human initiated a medium response, the reaction back, at least 44 um, out of 70, whatever that is, um, also was medium. So again, there's a little bit of some of the patterns being formed here. Um, and then really what he wants to get into in the end of this book is, are there signs of intelligence with these UFO responses? And he argues this. He says, first, the UFO phenomenon acts as if they're intelligently controlled. Um, evidence includes overt responses from the UFOs um, to human behavior. UFOs duplicating complex human behavior in some instances. Similar response uh, sequences observed when UFOs are shot at and struck. UFOs departing from approaching airplanes but approaching hazy surface and vehicles. So there's um, patterns of behavior here that he's saying that acts as if it is intelligent control. Second, the report suggests that UFO phenomenon exhibits self-restraint and not responding in kind to human behavior. We kind of talked about that. UFOs seldom fire back when being fired at. Um, this, he says this raises questions about whether this restraint is due to natural limitations or deliberate choice, indicating uh, maybe intelligence and wisdom. Third, in most cases of human aggression, there were missed opportunities for deeper communication, um, which is not indicative of intelligence or wisdom on our side, right? So if I see your phone, my first response is fire a shotgun at it, it's a missed opportunity uh, on the human side. So um, all the responses suggest intelligence, and this is this is interesting here. So when when on the left is all the, the, the human behaviors. So is it friendly human behavior, hostile human behavior, miscellaneous UFO behavior? And let's just look at kind of um, responses of UFOs. There are more than once, unless it says one, right? It's count of one, but you see some of them have up to 12, 10, 11 counts of this type of response. And so from friendly human behavior, on, as, a, as a whole here, UFOs um, rock, rock back and forth. They signal back with a the light. Um, they approach the witness directly. Uh, they return the signal exactly. Um, you know, a, a aggressive behavior, it flew away when struck by bullets, right? Um, Passing miscellaneous, it, um, it would circle the vehicles. So these are all signs of, of intelligence, right? Kind of a, a summary of all 242 cases here. And not just uh, cases about UFOs, but cases where humans are trying to interact with UFOs and there's a response back. And all of this together, look at 242 cases, you have kind of these repeated um, responses back, does seem to indicate intelligence. And last, this is really similar, but just on the humanoid responses. So, um, you know, they, they wave back 
to the friendly behavior or, or they left, right? The hostile behavior, most of them walked or ran away, right? Um, so you kind of see these responses again indicating some level of intelligence. So this is where I'm really excited about, uh, you know, and, and I, I, have, I had CE5 or, or, or have CE5 high human initiative contact experience about the last two years or so. And, and I love um, researching or reading as much as I can. And I like to go onto Google Scholar or an academic database to figure out what does science talk about this, right? Um, what can be learned? And specific to this very um, nuanced topic within ufology, there's just not a lot out there that's done in a scientific manner, right? And these, what I just presented on is, in my you know, humble research, the closest or the, the most academic stuff that I found on human initiative and contact. But I feel like we can go a lot further. So I want to start with praise first for these speakers, and I want to get into some criticisms and um, where science can go from now. So praise for Dr. Uh, Costa Navarro. Um, I like that there's a novel way, his 12, his 12 criteria is a novel way to authenticate these experiences. Um, I think its strength is that he built a tool to capture certain data points. So those six subjective and six subject criteria were purposefully designed to measure something, right? Um, or something put, yeah, it's capturing specific data for its hypothesis, which I think is lacking, and I'll, I'll speak to this more in common. Um, there, like I talked about, there's little published research on consciousness based UFO connection, and this is um, printed in journals, so it's exciting to even have that out there. Uh, retestability, so we did it twice with two different groups. Um, I think that's also praised that his work wasn't just done once, but that he did it twice and that there's some repeatability here. Um, and lastly, that we get raw, kind of raw data with this 12 criteria rule, or at least data that I can go and rebuild into tables and summarize and look for my own, um, you know, variables or outliers or things like that with. Praise for Haynes, his scientific pedigree approach are most appreciated on this topic. Um, his meticulous covering of 242 cases, you can tell from reading the book and how he organizes it, it's very um, structured and, and, and um, intentional. Again, with little scientific research on human issue contact, um, it's a contribution to have, to have these books. Dr. Haynes pr presents a method for collecting and categorizing data. Um, how can these be applied to future cases? Dr. Haynes' final analysis on response suggests that intelligence is outstanding. She threw those last tables that I showed you kind of summarizing all cases. So really I'm looking at like, can papers, you know, can Dr. Koss's work be forwarded, right? Um, can, we, can we move forward in C5 cases or, or people that are giving the highest human initiative contact? And, and continue with these 12 criteria, right? Or do we continue and maybe using some of the criteria that is on your, on your paper in front of you, right? The duration of behavior, the complexity of your behavior, other ways to kind of continue to build and capture data, but let's go further than that. Criticism, so while both the Costa Navarro um, focuses, okay, sorry, while, while the Costa Navarro focuses on, on consciousness interactions of any type, and Haynes focuses on human initiation of any type, there's, a, there's like a, a Venn diagram, but we're still missing the kind of this middle window. I believe research can go further by focusing on consciousness-based, human-initiated contact efforts and those, and those results. So Acosta Barrage is looking at everything conscious. Haynes is really looking at all the time, you know, tilting wing planes and flashing headlights, but it still feels like we're missing, you know, research on um, thought-based or consciousness-based human-initiated contact. Um, and why? Because both, both, both both these authors are doing it at the end of the day is still historical analysis. Um, where Heist experiments is something that can be done a lot. Um, this, this provides a method for collecting new data of your choice, rather than need to rely on historical accounts where we can't recreate those events, let alone know what type of, if there's any type of um, signatures or anything um, associated with it itself. This criticism is especially noted in that Acosta Navarro, in his case studies, mentions Mission of Rama, which is clearly an example of consciousness-based um, 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 interaction. And then Haynes works, as we saw in some of the case studies, is, is covering Dr. Greer's C-study work. And so if both are willing to publish these cases about human initiated contact and getting responses, right, of someone reaching out um, through consciousness, why not then do research with people trying to make this type of contact, right? This seems like the obvious place to go. Um, and the question is, what data should we be collecting during Heist experiments? Uh, it's often said that there's a lack of data within UFOs, and even this to me isn't the data, while well, there's plenty of data in these, I don't think it's the data that everyone always wants. What they really want is the data that associates a UFO as being something fantastic, right, or um, the silver bullet that proves that it truly was an anomalous thing that responded to this, and that's missing from here, right? Um, it's, it's still kind of historical. And so even with new um, applications that are out here to, to 
capture cases, I, I mentioned Enigma, level Alejandro, um, it's still analysis as in retrospect, right? It's still analysis saying, tell me about what happened, and then, um, but there's no real opportunity to gather the data for the event itself. And how are we, we, we really supposed to measure, test hypotheses, and experiment if we don't have a UFO in front of us? So consequently then, um, if, if we can seemingly communicate with UFOs, and they sometimes appear, what a perfect opportunity for scientific inquiry. And I have some suggestions for scientific inquiry here. Um, I'm gonna model these under two umbrellas. One is a, is a wide net approach, meaning let's just bring as many devices to a high condition contact event to see if any novel data appears. Um, kind of like just going like Doc Brown from Back to the Future, get all your gadgets on, go outside and just see if anything happens. This wide net approach can include cameras of all spectrums, ultraviolet, infrared, um, trifold meters, electromagnetic, software to find radio, look at radio signals, muon detector, cost wash looking at gravitational, or muons, um, photometer, something to measure light, right? Maybe the brightness of something. A random number generator, biofeedback sensor, you mentioned that tweeting sensation that was in some of those cases. An EEG reader, abuse device, body temperature, heart rate, does anything of this, uh, you know, can data be brought forward during these types of events? All this data can, and all of this data can be done in addition to the types of data already being collected, you know, by, by these kind of historical efforts, historical analysis efforts, right? So whether it's um, a new app that's coming out that says submit your UFO case there, what you're gonna submit there is gonna be location, when in the time, maybe some media of your event, and then a testimony, right? Which might include the length of your experience, the description of the shape, how it moved, the number of objects, the number of witnesses, estimated distance from the viewer, anything you can get into a testimony. But you can get all that with doing high experiments live, right? You can still get the testimony, you can still get the location, the when, the time. But you can also get new data, right? Um, if, if you know, or to try to collect signatures. The benefits of a wide net approach, uh, approach include just having an expanded aperture, if you will, due to a lack of certainty of what a signature could or should or will be there. Um, just a larger capacity to capture live data and it's exploratory. Um, there's just, you're in the discovery mode, right? So I, I think of Mark Sims, who's um, created a way with walkie-talkies and Faraday bags and, and getting contact. But like, will we know that without experimentation, right? So if there's more, if there's more communication or more information or more signatures that is possible out there, then we should, we should try to go see what can be done and what we can um, capture. And the second style, it's not really a wide net approach, right? Just like go out there and maybe if you can. The second style, which I have more energy behind, but it's a little harder, is to use precedent to define a hypothesis, right? So what precedent exists before this that can narrow down a hypothesis of what I should expect from this experiment? Um, so this style looks at how past features can inform these experiments. And um, I mean, this is a little bit of a tangent here, but imagine finding a unique signature, you know, um, of UFO phenomenon that happens this would power us to identify when something in the sky is anomalous, right? Whether that's for experiencers, for researchers, if we can put together a signal that's unique alongside a video, right, or alongside someone's testimony or whatever it is, um, that we know that this is truly an anomalous signal or something, that could be very empowering, right? We're getting to really authenticating that this is an anomalous experience. Um, and lucky for us, Congress has been putting that together some information, so I wanted to go over this. So this is all about precedent. So this is one idea for precedent, I'm gonna talk about software-defined radio or radio signals is a possible signature from UAP or UFOs. Um, in April, Dr. Kirkpatrick is from Aero pre presented at the Emerging Threat Capabilities Senate Intelligence Meeting, I think it was called, and they have been a little off that day. And in this, they went over a slide, which to me is, is an amazing slide, because we're summarizing UFOs from 1996 to 2023, almost 30 years. And in this, we have um, a part that says signatures. And so we're looking at 30 years of data and we're saying there are signatures that are associated with UFOs. And in this signature, we have one to three gigahertz, um, which would include on my next bullet here, SWR Skinwalker Ranch is very often talked about a 1.6 gigahertz signal. So I have two sources, right, if you will, from Skinwalker Ranch, and I have Sean Kirkpatrick's summary slide of the last 30 years or so of UFOs saying, look, radio signatures, one to three gigahertz, right? Lastly, I know someone in Brazil at the hotspot running for net, and I trust this guy, he's also saying that he's getting a 1.6 at a hot spot of where UFOs, you know, like Patina, Sedona, Arizona, something like this. So the question to me is, it just seems like 
human nation contact then is the next thing to go, right? Um, if we can find it here, we can find it here. And then if we can see if those, you know, or some anomalous things happen during human nation contact, would we find that same signature? That's enough precedent for me to act upon it, right? To be like, I can design it. But experiment here to be like, I'm looking for 1.6 because of these things, where that wide-end approach is just, we'll take anything it gets, right? Um, we also can look to contact modalities for precedent. So, um, EEG and FR MRI machines uh, have been used to study a variety of circumstances, including meditation, variety of meditations, transcendental meditation versus normal meditation, psychedelics, remote viewing, near-death experiences, or cardiac arrest, right? Um, so, all of this data has been picked up through the contact modalities and more. Um, so, maybe then we could look at the contact modalities uh, coined by Ray Fernandez, that's his language for kind of um, other air, well, I, I will get that. But can we look to things like, if, if there's a signature or unique reading during meditation or uh, in, a near-death experience or a, a certain psychedelic experience, would that would that be a clue then where we should look for the same signature when we're gonna go do human issue contact or CQ5? So if I see a lot of stuff happening for the EEG machines, there's some commonalities in brain waves or something like this, then maybe that's where I should start when I go to CQ5 is with a news device, with an EEG mirror. So again, I'm leaning on some precedent here. Um, more importantly than, in my personal opinion, than the scientific precedent, moving on here, I think that precedent for experience or hypothesis is particularly uh, a strong point to look at. So there's just, in my experience of meeting other experiencers, people and who have had or are actively doing kind of human issue contact, there's a, there's a common pattern of these type of things. They know exactly where I'm looking, right? Can we test this? I, I thought of a simple idea here of, I just put a GoPro on, Later, I can post it, I'm just gonna overlay a grid, right? Like a chessboard grid on it. Is the distribution in the center more often than it is somewhere else, right? You know, simple things to kind of talk about or to prove. Um, do they know where I'm looking? Well, you know, if it's always appearing in the center grid, right? Like there's some distributions here that we can use in science with. Can we, can we do science with, um, or we can premeditate places in the sky to appear, right? That's another easy way to do it. I'll often hear experiences with this saying, they know what I'm thinking, right? How can this be tested? I can sense them. I can sense them sometimes right before contact. Can we bring those biofeedback measures? You know, um, whether it's heart rate, temperature, the EEG machine, anything you read my body. Maybe that's where the signature is. It's not in the air or in the sky like the radio. It's, it's actually happening within me. Uh, so that's something maybe we can measure. It's a consciousness-based connection. I, I know this is a little beyond our science today, right? But if that's the majority of where the experiences are feeling it is, then how do we go and start to surround our studies around that? Um, feelings as if that are not traveling as much as they're appearing, right? Um, just an intuition from experiences. Um, and lastly, or, or just more takeaways from experience. I feel like looking to people's experiences can really help create precedent for what we should be looking at. Some implications of pondering as I move to my close here. Um, I've been talking a lot about this from a scientific angle, but I definitely want to speak to kind of a personal or spiritual consequence. Um, if you decide if, if ice is something you want to go do, uh, or try contact it might not stop, it might continue if you or last for a long time. Um, I, I just want to talk about that consequence, something real. Um, question, actually I'll let that. Works like free and beyond UFOs, there's just some more implications here, by Ray Fernandez, um, CCRI, and beyond UFOs, both and some other stuff, we're using the free study, but it really speaks to transformative change, and you read this in other literatures across contact modalities like near-death experience or psychedelic medicine right now, has a lot of the same thing where there's um, some type of transformation. We mentioned some of these even in what um, Acosta Navarro was finding, right? Critics of capitalism, a renewed sense of spirituality, right? A new ideals, a less fear of death, vegetarian or other um, lifestyle changes, right? Um, unitive experience and feelings. And so how, how can Heist and other contact modalities maybe be glimpses of reality on our normal senses? How can we learn to apply this knowledge? Um, a few more slides, we're almost here. Can we measure the unitive experience during Heist to better compare it to other unit of experience like NDEs and psychedelics. I just read a, a paper that was, that was comparing NDE and psychedelic or DMT experience specifically, and it used a mystical, question, a mystical experience questionnaire as a way to kind of unite their, um, or to compare and contrast unit of experiences. So if there's unit of experiences happening in CD5 or Heist, is there something that we could, you know, questionnaire or something where we could bring it to compare it to these other modalities? Um, Implications, do humans have the hardware for telepathic communication? Well, this, is this a dormant trait? Is it awakened? What's, if we're receiving, if we're projecting, and other stuff is hearing, what does it say about some type of hardware that we already have for telepathy? Um, just comments, it appears to be a form of communication, which is revelatory to me. Um, what can be learned from other cultures through us? 
right? And so beyond learning about um, UFOs or um, the nature of reality, which I think is huge, um, can we learn benefit humanity from exposure to other cultures? And then lastly here, can we find a unique signature within Heist to distinguish it? It's truly the UFO response to Heist or CP5. So to go beyond authenticating historically, but to develop um, a signature that we can authenticate cases live with. While the work presented, oh yes, yeah. While the work presented historically, can Heist be validated and experimental, right? So while both these works are looking at these historically, can we simply validate Heist experimentally, right? Uh, so Tyler and I talked about a control group, experimental group, right? One's just looking at stars, one's trying heist to see if there's any difference there. Um, and these psychedelics other contact with others have these common patterns of transformations I was just talking about. How does heist fit, fit in this picture? Um, they also report to open people up to other of those contact modalities. So you might have a heist, but then be exposed to a precognitive thought later, or um, or or have a Poltergeist or something, right? So it, it kind of like the, the consequences like they open you up to more of them. You might have an out-of-body experience later. If you have a near-death experience later, you might have something else. Um, you might have ice. Will these consequences ever reach some critical mass? This is just me kind of just thinking out loud here. Um, what, what, what is this? Are these demonstrations to provoke humanity towards something? Is that into a worldview like idealism where we're supposed to realize Oh, well, consciousness is fundamental, right? Is it meant to provoke us into a more connected identity, one that's less singular and ego-based? Are these experiences meant only for the experiencer themselves, right? Um, can I help us learn more about who they are or what the others are, maybe even more importantly, who we are? Um, if this is something that interests you, um, I know later tonight we'll have a CE5 human initiated contact that Tyler right here will be leading. Um, and Joe, yes. And so I'm super excited to go to that. Um, if that's something that you um, want to go out and try, I definitely brought my software based radio and we have some other devices and we're going to go uh, preach what or practice, practice what we preach, preach today. Yeah. So um, that is it. I know we're really tight on time. I think I have like two, three, four minutes here. But um, my goal today was to present on where, where is science looking at this? You know, there's not a lot published in academic journals. I found what I could, I want to summarize it. I think it's cool that, that people are doing historical analysis. Um, even in books like Haynes, I feel like we can go further with it. This seems like the lowest hanging fruit for scientific inquiry across like ufology and things like that. If it's, yeah, it's just advanced and you need some type of experimentation. And with that, I am done. So thank you for listening today. And uh, time to keep guests.